your stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday. And they want to develop clarity about their natural strengths, what their next adventure might look like. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into dissatisfaction and also where their strengths lie and where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that are limiting their success and discovering how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. Well, this is a time where I get to interview somebody that I admire and respect so much right here in Helena, Montana, which as many amazing people are here, I rarely get to take this opportunity to interview them on my podcast. So um, I am going to introduce my friend, Jen Gursky, Jennifer Gursky, who is the executive director of our local YWCA. And just as a, a reason, not that you need a reason to hear from her from me, because you'll know after you hear her speak. Um, but the reason I specifically reached out now is because I got to hear her speak at the uh, March for Reproductive Freedom here mm -hmm. in Helena at the Capitol building last year. And I already knew you were a powerhouse. Like I knew that you were a force <laughs> when I met you. But to hear you speak at that event was absolutely inspiring. Totally. Mm, thank I mean, you. I knew, but it it really caught me. And thank not you. off guard, but it caught me. It dragged yeah. me right in. And I thought, we'll be lucky to keep her in our little city <laughs> into the future. <laughs> because well, you. You, you have a, a national voice that um, I would like mm. to, to hear. Um, anyway. So I've gushed enough, Jen. Very um, kind, Sarah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for joining me. You bet. Um, you know that the first question I ask on these podcasts is um, I ask you to share something about yourself that most people might not know about you that wouldn't be on your LinkedIn bio or your resume. So what do you think? You have something you can share with us? Yeah. So I think... Um, a pretty integral part of my story is that um, I was raised by two teachers um, that were first year or first in our family to go to school. My dad grew up in the Flathead Valley in Montana and was generations in. And my mom was a Navy brat that grew up all around. And both of them were first generation college graduates. And the reason I bring that up is because um, they had the opportunity to give me a life that I don't think a lot of my cousins could have dreamed about. And they chose, right? So life is about engaging or disengaging. That's truly the power we have, right? We either get to engage or disengage. And so um, I will start there because I think it's a context for a lot of who I am and what I do. And I would say the other thing that is definitely not on my... Um, LinkedIn bio or even like our the YWCA's website is um, in high school, I started going to an evangelical church and um, did missions as an evangelical with um, an organization called YWAM, which is an Assemblies of God based missionary organization. And uh, I did a DTS in Amsterdam and then was placed in Cambodia for our outreach part. And it was from there, actually, that I decided that I wanted to live in Southeast Asia for the rest of my life. Side note, I live in Helena, Montana. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I applied. I, had, I was not a graduate at that time. I was about 25, about, yeah, 25 years old. And I was not, um, I, I didn't hold a college degree. I had gone to school for music. Um, I was a vocal performance major for three years, dropped out, and then became a youth pastor in um, this little town where I grew up in this evangelical church, and uh, then decided to do missions. Um, fell in love with Southeast Asia, like to the 
to this day, I just want to go back and applied to go to the University of Montana from a little internet kiosk in Phnom Penh. Um, and I think, yeah, so it was there, it was while I was doing my service in Cambodia that I was like, I have no idea what's confronting me, right? Now I have language for it. You know, it's like the developed versus undeveloped or global north, global south, or right, like colonialism, post-colonialism. I have words for the sheer um, poverty and system failure. Um, and so I went to the University of Montana and that's where I got my start in. I have an international relations degree now um, and a minor in Chinese and international development, um, which I think is a huge context for like where we head in our life, right? Like all of these like different things. So the thing that's not on the resume, like school is on the resume, right? Or school is on the LinkedIn. The thing that's not, that's not there is that I got there by being an evangelical missionary in Southeast Asia. <laughs> that's amazing. Wow. And, and um, vocal. <laughs> As, yeah. A, and vocal a performance. Musician, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So those are the things, you know, like the context of like the why, right? Like, why do we choose these certain things? And I would say I'm no longer a practicing evangelical, right? Like, I think that um, through school and through some other life circumstances, my life has certainly evolved to a different um, world frame. Um, but yeah, that's definitely what one of the main things that got me to where I am today. So I like wow. to kind of give a little homage to it. <laughs> Oh, I I so appreciate that because these are things I might have known bits and pieces of this, but the the whole time frame of going to school, dropping out. Where did you do your first set of three years in vocal? Yeah, performance? so uh, my parents, you know, first generation college grads. Um, I lived in Polson, Montana. My parents were teachers in Ronan, Montana, wow. and I applied to go to the school um, at University of Montana. Was accepted. Um, and then I also applied to go to this little school. I didn't really know. I will say that I think my, I was, I'm also the oldest, right? Like, I don't think, even though my parents were educators, like we didn't get that school was competitive for some reason. Like it just didn't cross my mind. I grew up in a little teeny town, right? Mm -hmm. Polson, Montana. Right. Um, and I knew that some of my peers and my, um, my classmates were applying for schools. And I was like, well, that's so far away. Like, it just didn't dawn on me what you needed to do to be on paper successful. So I applied to this little school in Powell, Wyoming. It's a community college. It's called Northwest College. And they were at the time one of, one of, one of 24 across the nation that were accredited for music education. And I had a full ride scholarship and a full ride for room and board. So it was completely paid for um, to just sing for a couple of years, which is obviously not what a music major is, a music music degree is very difficult, right. which I think ultimately was my demise. I'm like, I'm taking 14 credits, but it feels like I'm taking 25 because all these classes are only one credit. And I think eventually I just determined that because I loved something didn't mean that I had to earn money at it. Um, and ultimately decided that that's not going to be my profession. And then what do you do three years into a music degree, right? <laughs> yeah. You leave, you turn your life upside down and decide poli sci. Is the, <laughs> is the next one to go. <laughs> well, we kind of yeah. have that in common, actually, because I, yeah. I was a music major for a little while. Um, okay. And I did music therapy because I didn't want the, um, mm. com the competitive nature of performance. Mm. And I didn't want to be a teacher. So I thought, well, at least I can still do music yeah. if I do music therapy. Yeah. And I had been an English major at one point. And then I realized I really like eating. And none of these things are going to put food on my table. <laughs> so I ended <laughs> right, up with a business degree. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Because I think that you feel like you have to have that dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. You can struggle or you can make money, right? But one is doing something you love and one is something you, doing what you have to do. And I think we like, we really set up, I one of the things I learned from my own life experience is that we really set up 18 year olds with a dichotomy rather than the multi-universe of options. And it's really a disservice. It is. And to have yeah. this idea that somebody at 18 is going to want to know what they're going <laughs> to do. Absolutely. And then um, I actually have had these conversations with uh, recent grads from undergrad and, mm. and they're like, well, I don't know if I should do this or I should do this. And they're so full of angst about what they should do next. And every time I'm like, it doesn't matter pick right. something and don't think, oh, this is a five-year commitment. Think this is a one-year commitment. This is a two-year right. commitment. 
just try things. But that's not how we frame up the external world, right? We frame up at the time of like, my daughter is going into kindergarten. So I have a little girl who's very proud of her being five right now. (laughs) Um, And we set her up for a binary decision-making process, right? Do you want this or this? Do you want this or this? And then, which is wonderful, but we as parents then coach our child to stick with it, right? Oh, you don't like soccer? Well, it's only six weeks, honey. We're going to finish it. So yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on how we do (laughs) post-secondary education (laughs) of our children, but I don't know if that's like all of what today is, but um, yeah, I have some thoughts and a lot of it comes from a lived experience and Mm -hmm. observations. I was also, so I went to the University of Montana, studied international relations with those minors, et cetera, and then was a non-trad student. So by the time I graduated, I was, I think, 30 31. And um, my senior year, I ran to be the student body president. So a 30 year old was basically running to be the governing officer for all of these very traditional age students, right? And so it allowed me to have this inside scope of what a post-secondary institution, such as a, you know, a, a university looks at and what enrollment rates look like and what, so like kind of the behind the Oz curtain. So yeah, right. I've got some opinions. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> I know I do as well. And um, what I, I think one of the things that we're learning now more than ever before is that there are millions of opportunities out there now. And before the pandemic, my both of my boys graduated from high school right before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And um, before the pandemic, I was telling them, look, there are traditional paths, but they're not common anymore. They're yeah. well-worn, but right. people aren't continuing on those traditional right. paths. Your door is wide open. Right. And some people really need the traditional pathways. They need to know what's expected of them next Mm -hmm. because it brings the structure. Right. And it also may set them up to be able to do something different in the future if they feel like they have that foundation. Right. But then there are kids like my younger son, who's definitely like path. What path? Was there was there a box? Was I supposed to get in that box? Yes, right. I'm just like he doesn't understand. Completely unaware. Just like (laughs) his mother. (laughs) Right. Good for him. And then the older son. Really hard for younger people to identify. You know, so good for him. It is. And then the older son is exactly the opposite. He's like his dad. He needs a structure. He needs that accountability. He needs. He needs to know what's going to happen next. Right. Right. I think we have to we have to be able to provide what they need when they need it Mm -hmm. and, and recognize it before they do. So, so coming back to your story of this, this discovery and going back to school, Mm. you're, you're in Southeast Asia and you apply to go to UM for political science or or international Mm -hmm. um, um, studies. What do you remember of that kiosk? Like you obviously have a visual memory of that experience. Oh, it was was an incredibly intense moment for me. I was really upset, actually. I mean, during that time, I, you know, I prayed a lot about the decision, felt very like this is my next step. And I was pretty upset because I really just wanted to live in Southeast Asia. I just, I wanted to live there. At the time I was helping um, with an orphanage that was, um, with, a t- like I was with a team of people, most of them, I was the only American on our team. Um, and I was working in an orphanage where this Australian woman just had this amazing and incredible heart, like just took in kiddos that were on the street, needed a place. And, um, Cambodia's adoption, um, well, international adoption is just basically non-existent, which, I actually herald them for. I think that that's an excellent policy, except that then what do you do for the children in a society that truly was only like, what, 10 years, maybe 15 years after the Khmer Rouge is when I was there. And so you have an entire generation, basically by genocide um, and the cultural differences. Anyway, it was just this immense experience that I didn't have a lot of tools to analyze and to put into a, like you're talking about the box, right? The structure. I really had no tools to build the box of understanding or the structure to understand. Um, and so we did a lot of, of 
um, orphaned kiddos uh, care. Um, we would, um, we went to, um, in Phnom Penh to the dump, right? Like this huge landfill where families lived on and collected recyclables. And I remember very distinctly that the house mom, this Australian woman, um, distinctly said, you're not to treat wounds with anything but a Band-Aid and water. Um, because if you treat with Neosporin, they won't have the antibodies that they need to live in this environment. And I just remember being incredibly frustrated, um, guilty, um, heartbroken, and also very happy that I could have the experience of what it looked like to provide something that you wouldn't normally ever be able to provide, right? And so all of these experiences are rolling up, like working in an HIV or orphanage, working with the kiddos that are placed, you know, in this landfill and living with their families, um, working and housed in this other orphanage. It was just a lot of children because that's the generation, right? So it was 15, af 15 years after Khmer Rouge and I'm working with six, seven and eight year olds. That makes a lot of sense. I didn't have any historical context to do the work that I was doing. And it might've been better that way. Cause I think I was more authentic, authentically there for the children that I was with and not there as a, somebody who is analyzing political systems or thinking about this, then, and that, and A plus B equals C and et cetera. Like I was really emotionally available to be reading a story, right? Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't know the trauma. It also incapacitated me in a way that because I didn't know the trauma, I couldn't be an advocate. I was purely a care provider. And I think when I, when I look back at those memories, I think I was frustrated because I will be 100% honest. I am not the world's best caregiver, right? Like, I think I have those <laughs> skills. I love providing resources for caregivers. Like, I just know innately, I am not the one with the Kleenex to come and help you wipe your nose. Like, there is just like, I have a sister that is a, an empath and that is her gig. And I have always been this type A, you know, in a disc analysis, high D, high I. The S and the C, barely so existent, much. right? <laughs> I know that my strengths are like administration, analyzing of systems, et cetera, et cetera. And yet it comes from this pull of justice. And, and even then as an evangelical, mm -hmm. right? As this person who is on the missionary field, it was like, why is this happening? And here we are using American dollars because during that time, Cambodia linked their dollar, their, their monetary system to the US dollar. And I'm using American money. I'm the only American on my team. So I'm the only one having kind of this weird experience of knowing some of the politics using Amer literal American dollars to pay for things at the market, a street market, and thinking, I have no skills to live here. And that's what put me into thinking, mm -hmm. I need more skills. How do I obtain that? And that's when I got into the kiosk. I mean, it was like, go spend um, 30 rails for, you know, an hour of internet time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is probably about 10, 13 years ago. And so it's still pretty a disparate like access to technology in Cambodia. So yeah, I remember sitting with fans, no air conditioner, sweaty dudes on either side and hearing I'm trying to write an eloquent essay. And now how silly is it? Like I was trying to perform and now how silly is it? I could have just said, I'm writing from Phnom Penh, right? Like, there's your application. And, you know, before I was like, please, please, I'm really smart. Here's my transcript. Promise, please let me in. Just because of my context then of my right. parents' as first generation college graduates, I had mm. no idea how to do what I was doing. I just knew I needed more. Mm. So, yeah, mm. that's kind of how that happened. Well, just one of the things that popped into my head was when you say I'm high D, high I you know, the SC is non-existent, except that being those things doesn't mean you, you aren't compassionate. Right. right. Absolutely. Somebody asked me about that in her strengths finder results. Cause she has all these, um, uh, executing and strategic thinking mm, strengths at the yeah. top and no relationship building. She said, does that mean I'm bad at relationships? <laughs> like, yeah. no, right. that's a character trait, right? And right. Being a compassionate right. human has nothing to do with your strengths. 100%. Either you're compassionate or you're not, mm -hmm. or you learn compassion. So, well, and I think like as a woman growing up, right. So as a, a girl growing up, when you have 
strong execution skills, system analysis, high D, you get named something different than little boys get named, right? Bossy. And so it was right, bossy. I, I was that. a bulldozer. I got bulldozer a lot when I was a little child. Uh, my grandmother nicknamed me the bulldozer child. What she really meant was out of love of like, you look at something and you get it, right? right. Like you are determined and you get it. Um, but that, those skills, I think that's one of the things that I learned being. And, and then I returned like in school to Kuala Lumpur. Just, I still just have such a passion for over there, but um, it's the motivation behind how you utilize your skills, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. right? Exactly. So if my core values are compassion and integrity, those are the two things that I'm going to take with me in my determination to see systems work for people who are caring for people. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And we need both. Yeah, 100%. We need your sister and we need you. And 100%. And I think that's one of the most beautiful parts about doing the, the work that I do with teams is recognizing and valuing mm. those two really different skill sets and why they matter. I mean, I, I was just working with somebody who said, I just don't understand why there has to be all this emotion at work. Can't we just get our work done? Can't we just do our thing and stop being, you know, what's with all the drama? And I'm like, I hear you, believe me, because I'm a very practical person myself. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I started asking her, well, what does this person do when it comes to the team? When have you seen them really shine? And she had at least three stories of this particular person being there for somebody who had just lost her father and Mm -hmm. being the person who shows up with cookies on St. Patty's day that are green. Right. And being the person who makes people feel belonging in the organization, like, okay, you see what I mean here? Yeah. Yeah. You need all of these parts to make an innovative, successful, productive team. So absolutely. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I'm, I'm still stuck in this kiosk for some reason. (laughs) Okay, go for it. And I want to know what happened after you hit send. I mean, you had to have told the Australian woman that you were leaving. I mean, what was the next step? Because I remember being in my early 20s and um, I was actually 19 and 20 when I traveled to Australia for study abroad. Mm. And I can't even tell you how I knew what to do. I just kind of did things. You just did it, yeah. Yeah, so what, what happened next? Um, let's see, you know, I'm like reminded of the girls and girls, right? It was Sicily, 1922. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, it was Cambodia, the Pen. There's the wavy um, thing going, right? <laughs> that's right. Um, you know, I think, I think ultimately I pushed send when I got back, right? It was the, it was the motion of putting one foot in, in, in front of the other and dedicating myself to, I think this is my next step let's put motion to that. Um, I had an end date. And so part of this was um, actually going back to that box, right? Going back to the framework. Some of this was a framework that was set up to me. Like I had a departure date from Cambodia that was, I think it was March, right? And so I knew that I had so much time um, that I would land back in Amsterdam after. So the, the way YWAM works is the DTS, it's called Discipleship Training School. And a DTS is you have to do it. It's like English 101 in college, right? Every person has to meet their minimum basic standards. And so this DTS was the first step in me having basically a career in YWAM. And so my whole intention was to go study Chinese, study international relations, and come back, right? So I had done a number of months of schooling in Amsterdam, right, in the red light district, and then went to Cambodia right after that. And then my intention was, okay, I'm going to go get my degree in these things that I think will help me. And the reason I picked Chinese, which I did study way hard for a 27-year-old to pick up Chinese as the first, second language. (laughs) I'm an English speaker, but it's also a business language in Southeast Asia. So I knew if I had English and Chinese, I could communicate with most of Southeast Asia. And that was the plan. And things just kind of changed when I went to school and um, my framework for how I view the world, my perceptions. I don't think my core values, but like maybe how I put my core values to use changed. So yeah, from the kiosk, what I will tell you is it was this wave of 
from anxiety and the unknown to, I know what my next step is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was after that, but I thought that I was going to go into full-time service. I didn't at that time. Also, I was like unattached, had no children. I mean, there were other things in my life. I was supported by a church that wasn't, that they were not going to let me fall. Right. Right. Um, And my, my standards for what I needed were so low as far as just like, I think I lived on my, you know, my friend's couch for a couple of months and, you Mm -hmm. know, like, cool, I'm doing this. What you do. I'm going to go be a missionary. Yeah. Right. Um, And obviously that changes. Right. Mm -hmm. When, with it, which whatever path we choose to navigate. So do you remember when things changed for you in terms of evangelical belief system, that framework? Yeah. Do you remember a person you met or a a specific situation where you went, oh, that's, that's not, that is not in alignment anymore? Um, No, I don't. It's not, it's not a specific, right? Like it's not like I specifically remember when I entered that faith, right? Like there was a literally a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Right? right. And, um, but I don't remember what was that and moment. So, are you willing to share? Oh, absolutely. I was a teenager and I went to some concert. It was actually at a comedian, a Christian comedian show. And I went for youth group and, you know, a typical evangelical story is you raise your hand to accept Jesus in your heart. And then you go to a room and pray. And I like, I remember all of that, but I do think that my transition away from it actually had a lot to do with my values. Right. And so I think that the experience that I had in Cambodia and then later in Malaysia. So in Malaysia, I did an internship with Tanaganita, which is a women's empowerment organization that specifically worked in human trafficking in Southeast Asia. Um, and during that time, it was this narrowly focused, like, okay, women's issues, I think maybe trafficking, like the more that I went through school, it was the more, so there's a, there's a verse and it's in um, Psalm, no Proverbs, and it's Proverbs 31, eight. And I don't love 31 because it's all about like this woman who is cherished and blah, blah, blah. But there is a piece at it at the bottom where it talks about strengths and talking about, and the whole thing is that we stand up for those without a voice and we seek justice for those who cannot seek themselves. And that, I, I feel like I read that when I was in Cambodia and it just was like this whoosh of like, that is my life to the point where even I met my husband like six years later. And that was, and he grew up, um, pretty strict Lutheran. And I grew up you know, what I just described and, and Presbyterian. Right. And, uh, that is the thing that actually was our, our wedding vows where he is now, like he was a public defender and, and the charter for compassion, the charter for compassion and that verse were the things that we vowed ourselves to. And so I think that the, the motivational values that I hold as really this just core belief of who I am and how I navigate the world and how I walk through the world with this identity that is Jen Gursky is I want to exude compassion and have integrity in every interaction. And so once I started thinking about those values, and I don't know, again, I don't know that I had it down to like two vocab words, right? Mm -hmm. But those have just been such an, just such a deep, um, like in the pit of my stomach thing that I hold true. Once I started holding those values against some of the exclusionary practices of the evangelical church, and I started just doing some of my own research and thought and prayer. And, you know, my husband and I are still Christians. We just practice in a very different way um, because the value system that we learn. So I don't think that it was like this one step away. I think it was... I don't know how to not like a family member because she's gay, or I don't know how to not accept somebody when we're called to like whatever the red letters read in Jesus. Right. I don't know how we're called to, I think part of it was being in the legislature. So I was in the legislature in 2013, um, the Montana state legislature, and I was a house member And truly, it was trying to navigate where I thought I was still an evangelical. I was going to a pretty evangelical church at the university when I was there. And um, not being able to understand, there was such a dichotomy, there was a dissonance, I would say, between my fellow evangelicals and what I strongly believed was walking out that faith, right? Mm. I was a Democrat. 
And so I think I have, I get confused a lot of people because here I am as an evangelical Christian and I'm like, (laughs) and I'm a Democrat, right? And so (laughs) I had to like explain some of it, but it was also like you mentioned, you know, you heard the reproductive rights, like I was the MC, um, abortion access, right? Like access for trans kids to be who they want, right? Access. It's just this how, what does speaking up for those without a voice look like? I think it looks like for the minority, whether you believe in what they're doing or not. Right. And so I think a lot of it actually came from this thread of like this high D this justice seeking. And I'll use the the bulldozer term that my grandma, like Mm -hmm. I just saw what equity and equality looked like. I had a role and I had to strive towards it. So I don't think it was any one thing but it was a slow movement away and then leaving Helena um, or leaving Missoula to come to Helena. So I was representative out of Missoula to come to Helena because I met what turns out to be my husband, you know, a couple of years later. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it was easy because it was also a place movement, right? Like I moved right. from my church home family and then entered into Helena where I got to actually explore what my identity, not what what I thought the boxes were for, right? The box right. of the Democrat or the box of the evangelical church. Mm-hmm. I got to explore that my own way. And now I think I'm, I'm finally navigating in what that looks like for me. Mm. So, I'm a big believer in the environment playing a huge role in our 100% shift. Exactly. Yeah. And it may yeah. have been on a dimmer switch, but once you got to Helena, the light could come on brighter because you weren't beholden to the community. 100% belonged to somewhere else. And expectations of conformity. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I really believe so strongly in developing the community, nurturing the community that helps mm-hmm. you bring your best self and the clarity that you need to do what you're doing, to do what right. I'm doing, to right. Um, really contribute. Right. In a way that's right. meaningful for us. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. I I hadn't realized that that was the trajectory that it had come mm. really the 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 light went from the dimmer switch to the the on position at that right. point. Well, yeah, and I think actually, you know, maybe if I were to say any one pivot point, it was my time in the legislature mm-hmm. having to decide like on the record your votes. What do you conform to? Right. And do you get an individual choice in that or do you take a caucus vote or do you take a faith vote? And I think a lot of, you know, in the the beginning, we're talking about the binary decision. Right. Like for me, it was do I have faith or do I believe politically what I believe? And there really wasn't a lot of room to intersect those two. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, prior to the legislature and the legislature was was my ability to hold both identities and merge them into one person who deeply felt that representing other people in a voting system was an incredible privilege and um, a lot of responsibility, right? A lot of responsibility to make the right call for the people you represented because ultimately it's their lives that you affect. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was, as you're saying, the dimmer switch went full on bright was in those 90 days. Ooh, yeah, that's intense. It gets yeah. 90 days. It goes by so fast, but you're there for 12 to 14 hours a day right. on the capital. Campaign. 100%. It's still a very huge, I mean, as yeah. I discussed, you know, Cambodia and the kiosk, mm-hmm. it's a huge pivot point for me where I mm-hmm. think, again, you know, deeply reaching into those core set values. Mm-hmm. And then how do you exemplify that? What does that look like on the outside? How do you say to the person who hands up the Bible in one thing of saying, this is what, and they're totally opposite sides of the, the aisle. And we're talking about sanctuary cities. And then I get to hold up the same old Testament and say, actually, our God said to welcome the strangers. So, and so, you know, like. <laughs> you could hold space for both in a way that you never had had that opportunity or concept really yeah. i mean you knew it i think for myself right but not for the other right. person i was like how dare you represent this like that yes yes <laughs> so it has like that again so same, right? justice right where you're just right. like pushing 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 and you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong 
Um, yeah. Anyway, to, but to be an ambassador for that middle space of being absolutely. Able- and I think that a lot of people wow. are caught there, right? Yes. Like we are not black and white individuals. We are gray. And the minute we become black and white is the minute that like, it's like our soul has departed <laughs> truly, yes. right? Like we Absolutely. are made and born out of conflict, mm-hmm. right? And conflict is not a bad thing if we approach it in a way that we want to find harmony, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the gray. It's not a dichotomy. It's not binary. It is the gray of, I have to seek space to understand you. And I truly expect you to do the same so that we can find harmony in moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also something that I think, you know, my past like the religious philosophy of what I, I'm not going to say that was for everybody that has, you know, gone to an evangelical church or an assemblies of God church. But for me, I felt the world was so clean and easy when it was black and white. And I think we get set into that trap. And so we think easy versus complex. Mm -hmm. um, And we assign them values of good or bad. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was just talking about this with a friend this morning that um, we are complex beings. And when we go to this um, black and white, we lose ourselves because they're, they're, it doesn't exist. And at the same right. time, having that black and white, you're right, the word easy pops in. And right. I had a colleague that I was telling him that a, a year after my father passed, that I had felt mm-hmm. my dad's presence. I said, it was the weirdest mm-hmm. thing in this cool And, um, and he said, really, you know, he was really puzzled by it. And I said, well, Jewish people don't believe in heaven and hell. Right. It just isn't part of our belief system. And he said, well, I believe in, in heaven and hell and purgatory. And the next words out of his mouth were shocking to me. He said, it's just easier that way. Mm. And that's when it dawned on me that I could Mm. have no judgment for this. I couldn't judge him for this because Life is so complicated and can be so messy that if there's one thing that he can be certain of, even if he's not really certain of it, but if he thinks he can be certain of this one thing, of course, I mean, (laughs) if you can be certain of one thing, it it may set the foundation for other parts of your life to to make sense and to be easier for you to make decisions because at least this one thing is taken care of off my plate my faith, it's off my plate. You know, there's a scripture, um, and I don't remember where it is. It's actually been a number of years since I have truly studied um, the Bible, but Paul states something about don't let your, do not do anything that lets your weaker brother stumble, right? Mm -hmm. So he states this and, you know, and, and Paul is not a Jewish person, right? Like he comes to the faith by this miraculous intervention and et cetera, et cetera. But when you describe that, like when somebody needs the framework for black and white and somebody like that to me is the weaker brother. If I get to hold space and grace for you to be able to make things easy and you can't do the hard step of moving forward in complexity or gray, I'm going to hold that space for you. But I think the tension comes when that gray space becomes the absolute and then everybody else has to follow that absolute. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's even the tension that we're seeing now. I think you know, the discord in our country and from both sides of my way is right. And there's nobody willing to hold the space of complexity and gray. And I think when we get so truly arbitrarily (laughs) convinced that our way is the only way, I mean, that's what the discord is. And I think that that also runs against what my, you know, and I'm sure your practice, my practice and my faith is that's, that is not what we do with our brothers and sisters in humanity. Right. 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 Yeah. And I think that even just being able to hold it, right. And being able to hold that, like, you know, I having a family member who is gay and a family member who is um, non-binary in their um, gender experience. That's a lot of gray for an evangelical. (laughs) (laughs) There is no gray in love. 
and there is no gray in compassion and there is no gray in integrity. And so if, if we can operate from those core values, from where at whatever philosophy we take it from, mm. that is where we experience harmony. Mm. Right. Right. And it's so hard to do. Oh, I, I don't think it's hard to do. I think one-to-one or one to two or three in small groups, it's not hard to do. It's yeah, hard sure. to do on Facebook. It's hard to do <laughs> sure. it through the media because it doesn't touch on the complexity. It's this is good and this is bad. And mm. this is I right. I think and I might challenge bad. that. I do think it's hard to do because I think we live in a world that values power. So if we are going to have power, and that's not power with, it's power over, right? We are just, we are not taught how to do power with well. And I think power with is the complexity. And I think we are taught, like, and I, you know, when we, when we learn rhetoric, when we, you know, I was on the high school debate team and did it like, there is a right and wrong, right? And there is also a lot of ideas about what is right. And I think that, that gray matter is really hard because it's easier to have the framework and the yes or no. And I agree with you. Yeah. Social media and Facebook and quote unquote interacting. I don't think that that's true. Authentic interaction doesn't make that any easier, but I do think divergent opinions are still hard to navigate because we believe in power and we believe in right or wrong and there's no divergence from it. I hadn't quite thought of it that way. When I was talking about things being easy, I was really thinking about how we can one-to-one or in small groups, love each other without liking each other. Mm. Um, and I, I imagine like mm. the, the commercial or the video of, um, I can't remember, it was, a, I think a beer company that did this. They had two people in a room having to build furniture together, like Ikea style furniture together. (laughs) Yeah. Did you see that one? No, Um, but I can uh, already imagine because Ikea furniture, like what is the most frustrating thing in the world? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. They put these two completely opposite people together um, to build this without introducing them to each other. They just say, okay, you volunteered for this. This is what you need to do. Can you do this together? And the, as a, as a, um, observer, we get to see their interviews before they meet, which is, you know, I don't believe in, in multiple genders, it's boy and girl, and that's it. And anyone who says otherwise is, you know, just, doesn't understand their own body or, you know, like really, really intense on that front. And that person is paired up with a trans person. Mm. Mm. And um, he doesn't know that she's trans. Right. So they put this thing together. And then when they're done, they get to sit and have a beer together. And they have this little bar mm. set up and then they play the video of their interviews with oh, them wow. watching. And suddenly this, they look at each other like, oh, shit, <laughs> like, that is yeah. not expecting. And one of them goes, oh, well, no, I can't be friends with you. And turns around and starts to walk away. And, you know, those of us watching are gasping like, oh, and he turns around and goes, oh, I'm just kidding. You know, and he comes back and yeah. they shake hands and they decide to keep in touch. And this was the man with the trans woman. Yeah. And, um, they, they do this with a series of like four or five people. And that's why I say one-to-one in yeah. a certain environment, it doesn't have to be that hard. We make it harder mm-hmm. because we have this image of what's right and what's wrong in our heads. And then right. when we meet with that image right in front of us, we don't know necessarily. Yeah. So I, I that's where I keep coming back to. Yeah. I think it doesn't I have think to there's be a lot hard. there. I, yes. I think there's a lot there, Sarah. And I also think how then, okay, so this is, you know, the administrator, the D. How do we scale it? Then I look, right, how do we scale it? (laughs) How do we say that, oh, so a lot of um, gay marriage rights, right, came Mm -hmm. from the opposition having personal experiences in their family that the people that they were talking about weren't actually evil. 
right? Right. right? And so it came from the opposition having a personal life experience. How do we have, you know, in my work right now, I'm working with um, women who are in poverty, who are part of the criminal justice system, who have mental health and substance use disorders, who um, have children and their families involved in the CPS system, and they're homeless, right? So these are the five realities that we work with right now. And I think, how do you have that personal experience to be able to relate to people who literally have no bootstraps and how are they supposed to pull themselves up? Mm -hmm. So I think about that and like one of the women that I serve with those five realities is never going to build an Ikea furniture and have a beer, right? Right. It is very rare because of how our society is structured. You know, people of certain socioeconomic classes do a lot of things together, their faith, their politics, their volunteers their charity, their like whatever sense they build community in. And that's one of the things that, you know, in the work that we do at the YWCA is how do we present a different way to network and socialize because that's our reality. And I think my struggle in, yes, do we exert compassion and integrity and love in our one-on-one conversations? Yeah, because we're being forced to. Like almost in a way, right? Like it's this test scenario of like, I have to accept your humanity because you're literally in front of me. Exactly. How do we accept the dignity and humanity of those that we will never have contact with, but they deserve the dignity and respect of us showing compassion and grace for them? So yeah, how do we scale it? But also Mm -hmm. like as a person who, you know, it was only for one term, but voted up and down on laws from Montana, I have to bring that value to a scale. That's how we change the world. And, you know, in my frame, I'm thinking, okay, so now I'm responsible for this micro change you first. Right, exactly. So this (laughs) microcosm of the YWCA and 20 staff, right? And our mission is to eliminate racism and empower women. And we do that through substance use recovery program for women. And then we do that through therapeutic child care intervention, right? I have to create some sort of story that creates the humanity in front of the folks that support the YWCA so that they can have that shared experience of humanity. I mean, that's truly what fundraising is, right? So we have to fundraise in order to provide the services that our government doesn't provide Right. And so it is literally linking people through opportunities and this network of compassion and grace where we give an opportunity for somebody else to accept the humanity and the dignity, the value of somebody they're never going to come into contact with because of Mm -hmm. how our society is structured. And I think like when I think about me, like in how I and I I just don't want to prescribe this for anybody else, but for me and how I navigate the world that's the not easy work that I think I'm talking about, right? Like how do we build an analysis that is intuitive in compassion and grace so that when we come for the opportunity to give the compassion for somebody we're never going to sit in front of and see their humanity, that we still have something to pour out. Well, I have to say in my experience with the YWCA, since Kelly McBride was the director and now you in that position, you do this beautifully, almost magically. Um, I've oh, had the opportunity to, very to sing. Very kind, thank you. Well, I got to sing at the breakfast fundraiser. Yeah. That happened for years in a row and uh, right. kind of on the edge here. Pre, um, pre-global pandemic. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. But the videos that are produced of your residents mm-hmm. and yeah. um, seeing their humanity, they're always tear jerkers but not in a, a sad, we can't fix this overwhelmed way. Yeah. It's a tearjerker in, oh my gosh, we can make a difference. And yeah. I'm also yeah. working with housing organizations right now with strategic planning and team building mm. and stuff. And mm-hmm. what I'm finding is that people in general, especially in the nonprofit world in housing and dealing with these communities, so overwhelmed by the enormity of the problems yeah. we're facing, especially in housing. They're just overwhelmed. Yeah. They And yeah. one guy said, it's just, we can't do anything to fix this problem. We, you know, what we're doing is a drop in the bucket. And I said to him, but that family that's now housed in an mm. apartment and they were homeless for two years. 100%. Apartment, they're not a drop in the bucket to them. Right. 
Right. And because that family gets to break cycles because now they have exactly. generational wealth. Right. And so yeah. that does ripple effect. So even from a systems perspective, when you help, so when one woman comes through the, the wings program and is able to experience long-term recovery, um, empowerment, financial freedom, she's reunited with her kids And you realize that she came from multiple generations of physical abuse, drug abuse, poverty. Mm -hmm. You change the trajectory of an entire generation to come after. Absolutely. Absolutely. The micro, yes, yes, the micro and the macro have to work hand in hand. Because Mm -hmm. also what I will say is that housing person, and I'm sure like in my work, I don't want to just stop at one family because it's not... They're not a drop in their bucket, but helping one person to break cycles that we just mentioned, man, can you imagine if everybody had that opportunity? I can actually. Yeah, that's right. Kind of makes my eyes look a little bit. I can imagine that. That's right. Jen, this has been so enlightening, warm, um, thoughtful. I can't even... I can't even express how much I appreciate the the time that you've taken to talk to me and to our listeners. If our listeners want to learn more about you um, and about the organization, what can we do? Where can we send them? Yeah, so um, we have a website, just ywcahelena.org. And it's pretty thin. <laughs> We're working, right? Like sometimes the work overcomes the capacity to do the administrative underbelly stuff. Of course. Um, but yeah, there's some contact stuff there. Um, absolutely. Shoot me an email. Um, we are always, always looking for people to partner with in a myriad of ways. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Excellent. that's where I would suggest first. And then just say, I want to talk to Jen and, you know, we'll make some time. Absolutely. Well, I will uh, make sure for our listeners, those links will be on the website, elkinsconsulting.com in the show notes for this episode of your stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Thank you so much, Jen. Sarah, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Are you ready to start your story portfolio? So you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, My book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. Could you tell me that you're going away?